Okay, then Perfect. I should just start. So uh, welcome to my talk uh, titled Towards Aerial Manipulation in Large Workspaces. Uh, my name is Michael Vantage. Uh, I'm a PhD student with Roland Siegwald at the Autonomous Systems Lab, and I'm happy to present some of our recent work. So first of all, what actually is aerial manipulation? If you pull out the formal definition of aerial manipulation, it deals with grasping, positioning, assembling, and so on and so forth, everything what we do with our hands, but performed by a flying robot with arms and grippers. If we read a bit between the lines, what that means is basically we have to exert forces and torques from a floating base so that is not connected to anything. Uh, this is a pretty hard problem. Um, what does that mean in terms of how do we need to change our uh, flying machines to accomplish this uh, task? First of all, what we have seen in the past years is platforms with more degrees of freedom. For example, the original uh, omnidirectional MAV, which started out as a normal hexacopter with tilt arms so that we can change the force vector of each arm individually and as such uh, break this dependency of pitch and forward speed that a normal uh, quad has or hex. Then next, uh, a bit experimenting in morphologies. This is a product that is commercialized by one of our spin-offs called the Volero Tricopter, which is based on the original design, but has only two tilt arms and the reversible back propeller. It's not fully omnidirectional. It has a preferred uh, operation side and can only really choose pitch, but not roll, um, but is a bit more efficient. And then recently, what we really started to see is playing around with morphology. So this is a, a current focus project of ours that students developed, which first thought about we need an arm embedded in a, some sort of uh, structure and then we add uh, the flying capabilities around it so what we kind of can see here is we converge away from the traditional uh, drone or quad that we can all buy everywhere and the flying machines first become flying robots and then uh, or they first become robots and then they, they become flying to achieve whatever task they need to do Secondly, of course, uh, with the, all these new platforms came new control challenges. Uh, it's obvious that they're way more complex to control. One example is uh, actuator delays. For example, the tilt arms have a very different dynamic than the changing of RPM of the propellers. And of course, as soon as we're not flying in free space anymore, but want to drill a hole or paint something, precision becomes maybe more important. Force control becomes a topic. And airflow interference can become very difficult because we have we push a lot of air with these platforms. We're very close to structures, but it's all pretty difficult. Uh, there have been a lot of advances uh, in making this uh, possible, but these are some videos from experiments from our uh, group where you can see a platform omnidirectionally, uh, perpendicularly interfering with the surface. We have a similar platform with a milling end that mills soft materials, um, which, by the way, it was quite a fun experiment, but can get very messy because it flies, distributes the particles everywhere. Um, below, we have an example where we have a force torque sensor in the loop, so we can uh, apply the force in a very controlled way. But all of these um, advances, you can see they have all Wacken markers on them. They all happen more or less in the same room. And there is not so much yet in the large workspaces. So now that we established the base of aerial manipulation, let's go back to the main topic, which is aerial manipulation in large workspaces. And what do we mean by large workspaces? One example could be uh, inspect the infrastructure outside, where here we have an example of a bridge where the workspace of this um, aerial manipulator suddenly becomes hundreds of meters. We can go in one step further, um, which for natural sciences, we often need to take uh, probes. Here is a, an example of, um, at the moment, semi-autonomous uh, ice scoring, where our workspace suddenly can become kilometers in size. You see uh, me and my colleagues suddenly look relatively small compared to the workspace of this system. 
So uh, we're not quite there yet. So why don't we see um, aerial manipulators flying around and fixing remote infrastructure or maintaining power lines somewhere on the Gotthard of Passer uh, similar locations? Um, first of all, now that the control and the hardware is out of the way, we have to look at mapping and planning. There are quite some differences uh, compared to mapping and planning as we do it for traditional MAVs uh, in terms of representation planning approach. Uh, there's, of course, the question for range efficiency. Some of the previous talks already uh, mentioned this. Uh, this is pretty bad for rotor rings. Uh, what are we going to do about this? Especially for uh, omnidirectional rotor rings where we can have uh, the propellers generating also internal forces due to the propeller tilt. And lastly, uh, a very difficult problem, the state estimation, where we suddenly have much higher uh, requirements for precision, accuracy, and robustness of which at the moment we often use RTK GPS fused with uh, visual inertial odometry, but this is a whole can of worms on its own, which we're not gonna talk about today. So we're gonna talk about mapping and planning and range efficiency. Uh, I'll first focus on mapping and planning. So uh, let's go back to this uh, uh, drone or uh, OMAF inspecting this bridge. What do we actually want for, from mapping and planning processes in this scenario? Uh, one very important uh, requirement is high accuracy. Basically, each time we touch the surface, uh, we go through a controlled collision, if you want to name it that way. So, and to do this, uh, to get an exact contact, we need to know very exactly where the surface is. Just imagine the map is off by 15 centimeters. Uh, that's not going to go, uh, not going to end so well for the end effector and the platform usually. Next, uh, now that we are doing work on something, we usually want to traverse or move with respect to that work piece. For example, if we paint or clean a bridge, we want to move along this bridge. We don't want to avoid this bridge or just fly in free space. Uh, as already mentioned, these workspaces can get very large. And one interesting thing we realized over the last uh, two or three years is we often want to do aerial manipulation in very known environments. Uh, I have a collaboration with uh, in the NCCR DFAB with architects where we have basically a map and a plan uh, of everything already. We often work with uh, photogrammetry or laser scans from uh, laser scanners such as Leica scanners. If we compare this to most of the literature for traditional MAVs, we can see there's quite some difference. Uh, for traditional MAVs, which are often used for uh, search and uh, risk recovery, uh, in uh, search and rescue in disaster scenarios, uh, we often model the environment as a cluttered unknown thing that we need to safely um, move around. And we can compromise on planning accuracy and map accuracy as long as we don't crash into something. So we only need to know that there is an obstacle. We can inflate this obstacle uh, with the map discretization by a meter and we just fly around this obstacle and that's not a problem. And lastly, uh, here we're also mostly interested in traversing free space. Uh, usually people don't want to circle the obstacle exactly or move along a wall exactly, but just as long as you go from A to B, not crashing into stuff, not doing weird detours, that's good enough. So it's quite different requirements, quite a different environment. Um, which causes us to think about, again, what is a practical map representation for our problem, the problem of aerial manipulation, also in large workspaces. And if we think about map representation, again, we also need to think about how we plan in this map representation again. So most of uh, the next slides that I'm going to show has been published recently in uh, IEEE RIL in a paper called Mesh Manifold-Based Remain in Motion Planning. So, what surface representations are there? Uh, classically, uh, occupancy grids and voxel grids, uh, very widely used, very useful. Uh, we call these implicit representations because the surface is only recovered as a change between free space and occupied space. So we basically uh, divide the whole space volumetrically into free and occupied space, and we recover the surface only through the boundary of these two. They are really easy to construct, really efficient to query, but they scale really badly because of the fixed discretization. Next up are simple explicit representations such as point clouds and circles where we use geometric primitives to directly map the change between free and occupied space to surface. 
but these lack a neighborhood connection. There is no notion of a surface in these. So the obvious choices are meshes and nerves for explicit uh, representations of connectivity. And that's what we're going to use for our uh, planning. Uh, they lend themselves very nicely because uh, it's the default exchange format for uh, digital elevation maps, for building plans, for laser scans, and so on and so forth. Now that we have a surface representation with connectivity, how can we exploit this connectivity in an efficient way? And to do so, we basically take a trick from mathematics where we uh, interpret the original 3D surface as a lower dimensional 2D representation. We do this by using a conformal projection called mean value coordinates. And by doing so, we obtain a simplified planning space that is a geometrically equivalent called homeomorphic to the original space. So with this, essentially, we have a ironed out flattened representation of the complex 3D geometry. This then allows us to take any vector that we have in planning space uh, to map this through a Jacobian to the corresponding 3D vector in the original space. If we think one step ahead and just don't think just in vectors, but in let's say uh, potential fields or acceleration fields, we can generate uh, complex behavior in 3D by simply formulating the desired uh, accelerations on a very simplified 2D space. And this is exactly what we do in our planning approach. So basically we have one acceleration field that acts only within the 2D space or within the surface and another one that acts normal or perpendicular to the surface. By changing the goal positions in these individually, we can uh, select where we want to go in the surface and how far away we want to be in that surface. We then, yeah, those are defined in flattened space and they exhibit these potential field or acceleration field like uh, properties. We then map these through this uh, 2D, 3, 2D, 3D mapping into 3D and combine these policies in the optimal way using the formalism uh, proposed by Nathan Radcliffe et al. in their paper, Remain in Motion Policies, which gives us some guarantees and that they are combined in optimal sense with respect to their local metric. The important takeaway of this is by combining simple policies that are very easy to tune, we obtain a very complex behavior that in 3D space, only based on our current position velocity with respect to the uh, mesh or to the manifold, gives us the next best acceleration to find a almost global optimal path to reach a goal on that surface. So a very, very powerful uh, setup we have here. Uh, we evaluated this on uh, random trajectories on real world data. Here we have an example of a laser scan of a roof in Dupendorf where we generate random start and end points and have the different planners find shortest paths along that surface. Of course, the planning paradigm, as explained, is capable of more complicated actions, such as finding smooth trajectories that go to the surface or away from it, or fly in an equal distance along the surface. However, this is a, a good evaluation to see if it is able to extract the neighborhood information. We compare against the range of RRT, star-based planners, optimization-based planners, and uh, the theoretical optimal algorithm, which is called the uh, discrete geodesic algorithm, which gives us the shortest path on the mesh directly. How well does this work? Uh, we uh, evaluate on three different scenarios. Uh, one is interesting, the Rhone, which is a digital elevation map of the Rhone glacier, which has a size of the map size is on the order of 1.5 by kilometers by 700 meters, has a resolution of about five, seven centimeters. And is only because we only store the surface, it's about I think 10 or 15 megabytes. So as expected, uh, our algorithm and the theoretical optimal algorithm, uh, both are able to come up with successful plans 100% out, out of the time because they have a notion of the geometry. All the sampling-based planners have various problems in terms of sampling bottlenecks in highly curved uh, regions, um, of having issues in finding valid um, edges because they sample in a two-width white space and so on and so forth. Of course, this could probably be improved by using uh, much more complicated variants, but here we um, 
try to evaluate against the simple sampling based flooded at samples just in the space of the mesh and the projection based uh, sampler that samples in full 3D and projects it to the low, uh, closest point. Also, the optimization based planner can be made to work relatively nicely on easier scenarios, but with the same tuning. Uh, if you go to a really big map, uh, you would need to extend the degrees of freedom of the trajectory a lot to come up with a suitable plan. Uh, the important takeaway here is if a planner is able to know the geometry and the efficient traverse within the surface, it works much better than trying to infer this from sampling or optimization. Similarly, for planning time, this is where the discrete geodesic and our algorithm uh, have a bit of a difference. Ours is about uh, one, one and a half orders of magnitude faster for a full rest to rest trajectory. Um, interesting is for RLT star connect, that's just the time to get the first connection through between star and endpoint, which itself can take a long time. The rest of the sampling based planners operate on a fixed budget, and the runtime for optimization based planner is really variable. Uh, one thing it is important to note there is a bias for successful planning episodes in this plot. So, for example, with the optimization based jump planner, we see there were only two successful episodes here, and those happened on a very easy part of the, of the map. But more importantly, these compare full path integration rest to rest, whereas our planner only needs to evaluate the next best or uh, next best direction, which on average takes on the order of 10 microseconds. So this is very powerful in the way that if you need to adjust your plans, for example, based on some sensor readings or on some manual input, the time to the next answer that brings you in an almost optimal way to the target is only 10 microseconds with our planner, whereas with most other sampling based or optimization based planner, you would need to go through a full episode uh, of planning. So to conclude, uh, surface connectivity information is highly beneficial, uh, at least in structured, semi-structured environments. I wouldn't use this approach if you want to plan through a, a heavily uh, cluttered forest, for example. And what I find more interesting is that Policy-based reactive planning can really be an alternative to optimization-based or sampling-based planning. Um, this makes it the ideal framework for fast and reactive planning, because it's really fast and only needs one evaluation to and to incorporate uh, life center data and learn policies. So uh, we talked about mapping and planning. I showed you one of our approaches to solve this for large workspaces. Uh, what, what about the other problem, the range efficiency? So it's bad for rotary wings, so what do we do about this? Um, the obvious thing, what we do if there is the, the range is bad for a rotary wing is we take a somewhat uh, not too draggy platform that does what we need to do in this type, in this case, the tricopter, and we stick a wing on it. Uh, this sounds simpler than it is, but in case of this specific vehicle, there are some very nice properties why it works well with the wing. The resulting platform looks something like this. Uh, you might notice that it has no additional actuators um, and it uh, retains full manipulation capabilities, so it can still exert forces and torques and uh, it has a, a tiltable rotor arm and all the rotors have a tilt in this direction as well, plus the backprop is reversible. And using the already existing actuators on this omnidirectional MAV, we can control uh, yaw by using differential thrust with the props, roll by using differential wing tilt because it's not just a tilt wing, but both wings can tilt individually. And we are free of the usual problems with elevators because we have a reversible back propeller uh, that can control the pitch uh, independent of the angle of attack of the wings. So as a lot of weird flying modes, and it's a very interesting vehicle, uh, we did a full wind tunnel characterization, as you can see here, that's when it was in the wind tunnel. And at the moment, uh, we're preparing for fixed wing flight test. It already flew as a rotary wing that works uh, relatively nice, even with the wings. It flies nice in simulation. We will shortly before uh, flying in real in fixed wing. But from the wind tunnel characterization, we could already establish that it's fully controllable and have a full characterization of its lift drag ratios and efficiencies. And if you look at the, these results, here we have a plot of power needed for sustained flight at a specific velocity in its optimal configuration. 
we can see at hover we need about 650 watts to just stay at zero uh, meters per second because the platform is quite heavy it's uh, on the order of three kilograms and at about 17 meters per second we have uh, the optimal uh, endurance range for the wings where we have a cruise flight at 17 meters per second with just about 350 watts so in terms of range what does this translate to if we have uh, Zurich here if we only want to fly one way uh, we can fly pretty far it's about 27 kilometers if you with a bit of, uh, of, of slack for some inaccuracies in the model which brings us even over the border to Germany or almost to Ham or Zug. Uh, usually we don't fly one way, so we want to come back. Uh, if we look at this, we can probably fly on the order of 10 kilometers, manipulate something and fly back. And with this, it really becomes possible to basically take off in Hönkerberg, fly over to Uetliberg, uh, clean the windows, fix something in the infrastructure there and fly back uh, on one load of batteries. So uh, to conclude, uh, overall my talk, one thing important to realize, drones are becoming useful robots, surface maps and reactive planning instead of volumetric map and optimization is promising. And there seems to be a convergence of all sorts of flying vehicles, tilt wing, omnidirectional VTOL. And I actually wrote down this how long until they have legs to before knowing that someone actually is working on putting legs onto flying vehicles. So that was very nice to see. This I'd like to thank you and uh, I'm open for questions.